You're listening to the official podcast of the Libertarian Party of Georgia. Learn about local issues, meet candidates, and find out what we're doing to bring more options to Georgia voters. Now here's your host, Brent Hilburn. Welcome to the Georgia Liberty Cast. This is our uh, next episode in our continuing uh, visitation of candidates for state office. Um, our last uh, our last office that we're going to discuss is uh, governor. We we save the best for last. Um, tonight we have with us not only the chairperson of the Libertarian Party of Georgia, but also the Libertarian candidate for governor, Ted Metz. Hi, folks. And as always, behind the scenes, we have our producer extraordinaire, Matt Franklin, of Most Uniquest. So, Ted, welcome. Thank you, Brent. And we're going to jump right in. Uh, everyone that comes on the show has to answer the first question, and that is, why Libertarian? And at the same time, you can tell us about about Ted Metz. All right, start the timer. I want to make this short. Why Libertarian? Because Libertarian is really the only party in existence right now that has members who understand voluntarism, consent, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and who want less government, lower taxes, and understand that we could have a much more happy society if people would leave us alone and not tell us what to do and not steal our stuff. So, so then you're saying that uh, Georgia has a one-party system. I'm saying the entire country has a one-party system. No matter who has <laughs> a D or an R beside their name. Well, D and R are really the same, are the different, the other opposite sides of the same coin. Right. You know, so, flip a coin, red or blue. It's, right. It doesn't so matter. It's the same so, coin. So, so in essence, the Libertarian Party is the only opposition party uh, in, in, is, in modern politics at this point. Right. And, and, you know, one of my favorite stories is William F. Buckley telling his dad that he really wished there were, was a third party. And his dad said, son, it would be nice to have two parties. Yes. And this was back in the 50s. I mean, it was really consolidated that far back. Yes. I Once agree. they started restricting ballot access, having private primaries, using tax dollars to fund their runoffs and all this sort of thing, and then the gerrymandering and the, and the uh, essentially assembling a district to where it was always split pretty much even numbers in the House and the Senate, federal and state, because of the way they redistricted everything to make it like it's, it's, it's really the same group of people behind the closed doors shaking hands up until, I guess, this last election cycle when we had what I would consider to be Marcus, Marxist communists overtaking the Democratic National Committee, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, to mention one person who I feel is evil. But, um, yeah, so really in Georgia, we still have Democrat Party and Republican Party, but when it comes down to the end of the day, it seems like one of their most important issues is keeping people split between left and right, you know, the us, us against them, you know, the fascist against the anti-fascist, you know, the alt-right, alt-left, all this, you know, propaganda stuff that really doesn't serve humanity. It only serves the parties to keep us distracted so we don't really see what's going on. Exactly. Um, so, I so, go so, on. yeah. So, so we'll, we'll come back to that. But, but I want to ask you, you know, of all the, of all the offices you could have chosen, why governor? Why, why, why the big prize? <laughs> Well, um, who who are we talking to? Is this mace, mostly this is just a libertarian ob, audience, right? Mostly a libertarian. Um, audience. There, there's two reasons, really, maybe three reasons. Early on, we actually did try to reach out to people with, I guess, bigger pockets, bigger reach than I have, to run for governor on the Libertarian Party ticket, but I guess because they have no. You know they want to win, right? So right, they they would not. You know they didn't come on board to be our gubernatorial candidate. That left the slot open. We really didn't have any other candidate to do so. I was going to run again as insurance commissioner because that's actually been my professional background for the last thirty five forty years. Since we had a candidate for that and the governor slot was open, it was more important 
to have a governor candidate fill that slot than then let it just go open. Right. Yeah, and you know the one thing I think um people don't realize is all of our candidates are chosen at at a caucus at our convention and uh, and I'm talking specifically about the statewide candidates and 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 the other candidates who will, who who have to get on the ballot. But the nice thing is you're going to be on the ballot. I am on the and ballot. And you are going to get to talk and you are going to get to talk all the way about I, issues I, until I will, November. You're not going to, to get kicked all out and you will you will have a voice for the libertarians in Georgia all the way to November. Until I, November 8th and then probably beyond. Because, right. But I mean I know. think that's an important distinction because we are going to get to talk about the things that we don't normally get to talk about in uh, in elections because there's a libertarian voice. And you know I I, I think people need to really understand how important it is to have another voice in there. Because if you look at the Republican primary, it was six guys <laughs> talking, talking about immigration, all the same things. If you look at the Democratic primary, it was two ladies talking about all the same things. There was never anyone else talking about anything else. And now we have an opportunity for, you know, to at least have a discussion about those things. And we're going to go into some of those things. Cause I, I hope know, so. Because I know some of those of things really are, things. I know, I know some of those things are really important to you. So, so from the governor's standpoint or from a candidate um, uh, for governor, g- give us, give us the current state of Georgia politics. <laughs> I, I, I know it's a, it's an all, let me, let me, question. let me make a, uh, an allegory here. Cause I know a lot of people have seen the movie, the princess bride. Right. That's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it so you'll, you'll, you'll understand the, the analogy here. When the original Dread Pirate Roberts was ready to retire, he chose the hero of the story to replace him. And the legacy of the Dread Robert, Pirate Roberts goes on. So we have the same thing in Georgia where we have someone who basically is passing the keys to the kingdom to the next chosen pirate all along i've i've been saying this in public for for too long that georgia was started as a penal colony and it has remained a penal colony ever since right where we have top-down oppression <clears throat> anyway the, the you know the state of politics in georgia is business as usual you know when all these politicians always talk about being conservative i want to be conservative conservative what that really means is they don't want to upset the gravy train they don't want to upset the current system they don't want to upset the current uh, members of the Chamber of Commerce or American Legislative Exchange Council. All these people are, are, are behind the scenes, controlling the money flow, controlling the PACs, controlling the legislative process. You know, th- there's very few legislators that actually draft a bill. They just pick up a bill from one of their campaign contributors who say, here, this is the bill that, that you need to pass. And they, you know, bring it through a committee. I sat in a committee a transportation committee hearing with Brandon Beach and his buddy from, uh, I can't remember the acronym for the, for the state um, public private partnership that does all the toll roads. Right. Basically pushing that we're going to have more toll roads. Right. And of course the control of the toll roads and the construction of the toll roads is all going to this non-governmental agency who basically gets their bills passed whenever they want. So, so the, so the role, the role of the governor, obviously, you know, Georgia has, has in theory balanced government. Hmm. Uh, the governor should be there to be the, he should run the executive branch and he should have he the should, final say so opinion, over bills. Should be the watchdog of what kind of, I want to say, um, can I say corruption? Sure. Racketeering. Sure. Um, cronyism. You know, there, there, there is no, that's what's the problem with the government in, in, in general, but especially in Georgia, we have people that go down there as watchdogs to, to point out all of the collusion and cronyism that goes on, but it never stops. It just continues. So I would say the major problem in Georgia politics is cronyism because right. the people that actually run the show, the people that get things done are, are the people behind the scenes with the money. You know, the old, the old families, the old pirate families that were sent here in the penal colony days. Same families run Georgia now. You know, you'd look at it. The old forestry companies, the uh, 
Southern Company, you know, the energy company, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of big industry right. families who've been in it since, since Georgia was a colony. A lot, a lot of, a lot of institutional. Yes. That's, that's one of your, one, one, that's, one, and that's what I'm saying with yes. the, the Dread Pirate Roberts right. analogy is that these dynasties pass it on to the next generation. And each generation is prepared to take over their fiefdom. So Georgia is divided up by several fiefdoms. We know there's a North Georgia fiefdom. And that person whose name, uh, I won't say David something, uh, <laughs> up in North Georgia, he's he's done wonderful things for his county. But um, for the rest of Georgia, he's just an absolute tyrannical um, oppressor who suppresses bills. Same thing with our other governor candidate, Casey Cagle. That son of a gun sits on bills that are good bills, but for political purposes, he won't even bring them back to the floor for, for like a third read. So, so Georgia has a, Georgia has a long tradition of the governor, the governor setting out his legislative agenda, which is sort of antithetical completely to the way things are supposed to work. The bills are supposed to come in from the representatives from around the state, from what their citizens, from what, tell from them what them the people are telling them that they want need. That's right. Because I think Georgia, I, you know, not, not living in any other place other than Georgia, Georgia is unique in the sense that we have a lot of urban areas intermingled with a, a massive amount of farm and, and, you know, rural. When I, when I moved to DeKalb County in high school, where North Lake Mall is currently located was was an, an enormous um, dairy farm. Right. So, but but I mean, even even be, you know, when you get forty miles outside of Atlanta, you know, you have a lot of empty space. Then you hit another urban area like let's say Macon, and then between Macon and you know Savannah. How about I mean, between you, here and Augusta? Right. I, I mean, mean, you you just have a tremendous amount, and and you you can't tell me that the governor knows what everyone in those areas needs better than the representatives. So, so so be so the same with with the speaker of the house and so the same with the lieutenant governor so you know basically these three gentlemen at this point run the entire legislative uh, agenda uh, for the state of georgia so or at least they like to think they do well i mean in essence they do to the extent that you know we saw the sitting governor and the sitting uh uh, state house actually go uh, or the, the speaker of the house actually go and campaign against uh Matt one of Gertler. their own yeah Matt Gertler, one of their own uh because he likes to rock the boat so as well a, and the same thing happened I, I i actually was on sam moore's campaign staff where i helped him with his campaign and also charles gregory and that's kind of what got me involved in in the way georgia politics works is i was working with with Charlie Gregory as uh, an analyst for all the bills. Right. Charlie would send us the bills. We'd read the bills, give us our, you know, give our, our opinion of, of whether it's good or bad based on the Georgia constitution and the federal constitution and whether or not it was going to be economically um, beneficial to Georgia. Right. So that's, you know, that's, that's anyway, they, they, they brought a person in just before the end of qualifying and they supported this other candidate. And still they, a legislator, and they, and they, but right, basically, they, you, know, you know, another, another, another lawyer, party loyal lawyer that, 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 they, that, they, would, that would do and, exactly and what they much, wanted. Right. And, you know, but I, I mean, so, you know, yeah, I mean, this is ridiculous that, right. that, that the um, oppression, I, I can call it that, but I would say the tyrannical rule of, of the elite politicians has, has gotten to a point where somebody needs to stop it. All right, so let's let's dive into a couple of things here. Um, obviously, as governor, as as libertarian governor Ted Metz, you're going to sit in your office and do nothing except sign bills, <laughs> and veto bills. But but obviously, you know, everyone wants to know about the things that are important to them. That's the nature of citizens. They want to know today. It might be health care, could be immigration. Can I interrupt you right now? No, and absolutely. Say that, you Go know, ahead. The, the whole thing about that is. People don't know what they're concerned about, but they take opinions from the talking heads on TV that this is what's important to them. If you sat down and actually talked to them about what's important to them, you know, family, you know, a good family, a decent living wage, 
you know, not having to be in traffic all day long. Those, that's what's important to them. But you get these talking heads on TV talking about blah, 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 this and that. And then all of a sudden they, they hear the phone ring and they're taking a poll on that particular subject that was on, on propaganda news tonight. And, and that's what's important to them right now. Right. So people are basically fed opinions as this is what you, we want you to think today. Well, and, so, and, you know, and, that's and what I'm would, saying. You know, these things where you see these surveys about what's important to people right. are, are inherently skewed because it's coming from, from somebody that wants that to be their issue. Well, I think, I think everyone's going to, you know, all, all of my children have graduated. So, you know, while the education system is important, it's not the top of my list. But someone with a five-year-old, six-year-old, that becomes the top of that, you know, that becomes one of their most important things. Yeah. And I think from the governor's standpoint, they're going to want to know how the governor feels in the sense that, you know, we know you're libertarian, so you're going to have libertarian ideas about how education will run. As the governor, you're not really going to be involved. In no, but that. it's going to be a bully pulpit, pulpit where I can say, this is what's wrong with education. I have some really great friends in exactly. education who actually understand the whole child development process. Right. You but know, see, what, that's we have, the, what we that's have today the, in schools is not education. It is indoctrination. And we can tell that because it's document-based learning from a corporation who sells stuff that the parents can't even see. You know, we don't really know what our children are being taught, but we see the ramifications of, of, of people like David Hogg, who's, who's a high school student who's out av- currently advocating for, for the uh, repeal of the Second Amendment. Now, if, is that how kids are being taught in school, that, you know, the Constitution was a nice piece of paper written by a bunch of rich, old, slave-owning white guys who... <laughs> Who uh, didn't care about people? No, that's not really the. That's what they. That's what they will tell you, but you know that's not the fact. The thing is, they're they're taught emotional half truths. You know, Lincoln freed the slaves. You know, all that kind of you know right, right. nonsense. But but again, how do you fix education? You go back to actual factual historical stuff that actually has always worked, and teach reason, responsibility, and respect. And the other problem with with education, everybody wants a free education, free college, blah blah blah. Well, the first 12 years of college didn't work out. So are there being the first 12 years of free education didn't work out? We really need to go back to education and teach philosophy. We need to teach economics. We need to teach balancing a checkbook. We need to teach early child development. So when they get pregnant in high school, they know how to take care of their kids. We need to teach shop and, 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 and you know, other right. skills where the kids coming out of high school actually are prepared for life and have a skill that they can make a living at. That's really should be the purpose of the first 12 years of education. You know, this whole thing about teaching to the test is ridiculous. So big picture. They're not learning. They're not learning how to think. So big picture libertarian though is libertarian from the education standpoint would be we let parents, we, we get the state out of that decision making process. We get the feds. First of all, we get the federal government out of education. So governor, so governor Ted uh, pushes back against, uh, against mandates from, from, from the fed. And, and, and that has a lot of support within most educators because most educators now know that they spend 50 to 60% of their time doing paperwork, proving that they've taught such and such so that they, kids can pass the test. So we get, we get, we get Fedzilla. That's my, that's my, uh, I enjoy it. That, and then, my, and then what we're going to try to do also, you know, the whole education is really supposed to be under local control. Right. School district control. So, so again, back to the, to the libertarian side back of education. Back to the libertarian, the, you know, the constitutional We're, construct of how education is supposed to work. You know, there's nothing in the Constitution about providing education. So that's really should, always been a parental responsibility. And, and, right, and we leave it up to the parents and the local communities, and that's what libertarians bring to education. So, so I, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, transportation, obviously. Uh, you know, well, let's talk about transportation. A sure. Minute. You know, and this, this goes back to my whole, my whole issue that for the last 30 years, last 40 years, ever since I've been in Georgia and, and able to vote, it's been the same issues over and over again. They've been talking about transportation since the 60s. You know, and, and actually when I moved here, they had just finished Spaghetti Junction 285 at, at, at uh, 285 at 85. Right. And at that time, they were talking about the, the outer perimeter. If they had actually been able to complete the outer perimeter back in the 70s, there'd be a lot less traffic in downtown Georgia now. You know, uh, we're going to speak Atlanta specifically for just a moment. One of the problems with Atlanta that, that, that studies and, and papers that I've read indicate that the problem with Atlanta is 
we don't have enough feeders into the city. Right. You know, so that's why we have all these bottlenecks. So other ways to fix transportation, we are not even talking rural communities um, because everything seems to be focused on Atlanta. You know, we need, we have pretty decent highway systems between most of the major cities. We don't have through routes for trucks going from like, like Chicago to Miami. Yeah. They have to come through Atlanta, right? which is stupid. Or they we have need, to go around 285, which is in perpetual uh, construction. construction. So it's. And, and one, one easy solution is to mandate that no, no highway construction take place until after the hours of 8, 8, 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. in the morning or whatever, you know, rush hour starts. Right. Like they do in Europe and other, you know, intelligent countries. So right. that, that, would, that would be one thing. So that just, that's just, that's a small. But the other thing that we're not doing is like everything seems to be, they can only think two dimensionally. You know, let's make the road wider, make the road wider, make the road wider. Put in more lanes, put in more lanes, you know, to the point where we have roads that are half a mile wide. <laughs> right. And you're still stuck you still, because you, you can't, have, you can't you get have... from, from the left lane to the right lane or the right lane to the left lane to get off the highway, whatever. Right. We really need to do um, two-story double-decker highways in some of the most congested areas so that through traffic can, like, fly over the top and then, like, the surface traffic can remain on ground level. We can also do tunnel systems. I mean, good, good gracious. I mean, what's wrong with underground tunnels like they have in other places? That's what we need is we need a Holland tunnel that goes under Atlanta. <laughs> Absolutely. But we also need more like a, we need, we need more. Um, we need a Northern bypass from like Marietta to Gainesville. We need, we need more roads like that. To just eliminate all to eliminate of, some of the just stupid eliminate traffic. All and, then, the traffic and, then, and then we can talk about Johns Creek. If you ever tried to go through Norcross from, from DeKalb to uh, Gwinnett to North Fulton, that is just ridiculous. And again, a lot of that traffic can be alleviated with, with uh, double-decker road construction. Excellent. So, so a big... But again, I want to say again that we also need to take a look at our rural communities because they need quick ways to get to Atlanta without having to go in, on so many, you know, different highways to turn left, to turn right, to, you know, to get to where they're going. So we need some more direct routes from some of the rural areas. Into, into, the, into, into the, the urban areas, right. So Georgia just passed a tax cut, state income tax cut. Uh, Republicans have been in charge of government for <laughs> a decade. They've had complete control of the state for 10 years. That includes the majority in the House, the Senate, and they've pretty much held every single uh, statewide office. And we just now got any tax relief. So talk about a little bit. Well, about you say tax relief, but you know what? We didn't get any tax relief because they did the transportation tax, the gas tax, the t sploss They increased all kinds of other taxes. And, you know, so, but, but did we really get a break? No, net, but, it's, but it's packaged really nicely. Understand what I'm talking well, about. It I know looks what you're really about. nice. Like, like, oh, yeah, we, we, we get tax yes, reform. Get Whoa. Right. And next year, they'll probably, you know, find something wrong with it and have to, like, throw it out. But anyway, it, it, it's one of those carrot on a stick sort of thing. Like, oh, look at what we did. We finally accomplished something. But, you know, don't look at the right hand did because the left hand is stealing you blind. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the whole. We don't have a good source of other tax revenue in Georgia based on anything other than income and consumption, which is one of the reasons I'm such a strong advocate of industrial hemp. So talk, so talk about, talk about industrial hemp. Cause I know, I know cannabis and hemp are, are, uh, they're, cousins. they're probably the, yeah. And they're probably the cornerstone of, of uh, your campaign. So since you segued into it, let's talk about it. Well, and, and this also goes to education. It goes to everything. And it also goes to your SQLI thing, is that, you know, prosperity drives happiness. Prosperity drives more prosperity. Everything from, you know, getting back to the libertarian perspective on what's wrong with government is over-regulation, over-taxation, you know, oppressive amount of government. Your growing government takes away from, from people's ability to be happy because they can't go out to eat, they can't take their kids to the movie because it's just they don't have the, they don't have the money. Right. And then 
you know, the more regulation, I know so many small businesses just like shuddering because they can't stand the regulations anymore. The taxes are too high or, you know, NAFTA, CAFTA, what all, you know, SHAFTA, all these other federal legislations, and then the tariffs and all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's killing us. So let's, let's look at a completely different way to make pros, uh, make Georgia prosper because Georgia is after all a largely agrarian State. Yes, we, we still have, have we have, like we have the we biggest still have part of our economy yeah. is is agriculture. Right. So so talk about and with 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 industrial hemp. You know they 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 list at least fifty thousand different uses for industrial hemp. I'll say twenty five thousand, but I only can really speak intelligently about seven or eight <clears throat> specific uses that that really are beneficial to the planet, not just the economy, not just people, but but actually healthy for the entire environment. One of the things that we all talk about is, is, is alternative energy sources. And a lot of people talk about solar, you know, and this whole thing about solar panels and solar energy, blah, 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 is fine, but it's not efficient. It takes more energy input to make a solar panel, to make a windmill, to make any of these other alternative energy sources than they ever receive back out in energy output. But because of the Krebs cycle and, you know, photosynthesis and stuff, the most logical use for solar energy is to grow a fast-growing crop that can be converted to other sources of energy. Efficiently, converting hemp into biodiesel is 94% efficient. That means there's very little left over, and that's the direct conversion of sunlight into energy. Out of a, an acre field of cannabis, you can refine 300 gallons average yield of biodiesel. If we have a million acres, that's, you know, almost 3 billion gallons, which is more than sufficient to supply all of our power plants that are currently using oil. And therefore, pretty much, if we just did this in the right-of-ways on Georgia highways, growing hemp to convert to biodiesel to run our power plants, we could have free energy essentially but nobody thinks about that but beyond that you know hemp has so many other uses it, it can it, it does it can do everything that that dinosaur oil can do plastics basis for other chemicals pesticides you name it it can do it so if we want to lessen our dependence on for, foreign oil we need to grow hemp environmental too environmental concern well, we're going we're going to talk about yeah, that next right because there are a lot of places in Georgia where the soil has just gone, you know, it's no longer arable, which means you really can't grow anything in it because there's no longer any nutrients in it or it's saturated with pesticides or all these different things. Hemp is one of those just amazing miracle plants that will clean the soil. It's called soil mitigation. It will actually take toxins out of the soil, takes heavy metals out of the soil, and, and because they're not really sharing it in the news, they're planting hemp all around the uh in tokyo uh, what's the name of that plant uh help Kudzu? me out here no <laughs> the um the nuclear plant that, that blew up in oh, uh, in tokyo uh, fukushima fukushima thank you yes. they're they're planting hemp around fukushima and they're also doing it in chernobyl to clean the radiation out of the soil and it works really so you know, that's the other thing. We have a lot of estuaries, a lot of a lot of riverheads, et cetera. If we planted industrial hemp in those areas, it could clean our water supply, you know, it can so, clean the so environment. What, so what's what's the holdup? What's the holdup? Well, you know, there's too much money in, in, in agrochemicals, too much money in I think the holdup really is the propagandization of, of generations through the reefer madness thing. Because, you know, the, the whole story of, of the illegalization or the prohibition of cannabis and hemp has to do with crony capitalism. Would you like to speak? I'll speak to that for just a moment. H. Randolph Hearst, who, who had Pulpwood paper and, and all of the newspapers, you know, everyone's heard of Randolph Hearst. Right. Um, Rockefeller was the big steel guy and DuPont. This is a really interesting thing. The um, Marijuana Stamp Act of 1937 was enacted in November of 1937. DuPont's patent for, for nylon was granted in February of 1937. 
no coincidence there. No coincidence there. Okay, so anyway, you got you got Rockefeller, you got you got um, J.P. Morgan, and you got um, Dupont, and you have Rockefeller all sitting in a room with Harry Anslinger, basically concocting and fabricating reefer madness and a way to take hemp and industrial hemp and cannabis out of their out of their way for their monopoly positions cannabis cannabis indian cannabis which is also you know the the, the kind of with the thc content that that causes um intoxication right was the main ingredient in about 80% of all patent medicines. Um, cannabis indica was put on the U.S. pharmacopoeia in 1850 and not removed until 1942 after the American Medical Association finally figured out that the Marijuana Stamp Act also uh, outlawed and prohibited Indi Indian hemp, Indian cannabis, you know, the, the uh, cannabis that gets people high. So you know, that's the story of crony capitalism, um, and it, it just continues. So we have the same thing going on in other industries. Now we got, you know, the people that fight the cannabis movement now are the um, alcohol producers, big pharma. Um, you don't see so much out of the oil companies or, or the agri petro petrochemicals and, and uh, fertilizer and all those other pesticide people, but you get a lot of feedback um, pushback from the private prison systems. That's another, that's another, which is uh, another thing that, that legalizing cannabis would solve. It would solve the um, imprisonment of people over a nonviolent crime for possessing a plant that is basically a weed and will grow anywhere, which we should speak about now also, because hemp has a very short growth cycle in many places in Georgia, you could grow three crops a year. I've I've been looking at, at some of the um, information that's been coming out from other states about the crop yields and, and the amount of money per acre that these farmers are making, depending on what you're doing. If you're just using um, doing raw agricultural things for fiber, food, or fuel, or hempcrete, but not necessarily refining into CBD oils, the they're, they're getting an average of $300 per acre per crop. Now, soybeans, if they weren't subsidized, is about $100 an acre. So it's dramatically... Corn, even less. It's, it, 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 it is, it's, it is, it's dramatic. It's, 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 it's extremely profitable. And again, in Georgia, in, in many places in Georgia, because of, of a, a three-month growth cycle and our climate, you could actually get three crops a year. So, so how, does Governor, how does Libertarian Governor Ted get Georgia in the business of growing hemp. Executive order. It's that simple? Well, you know, it is that simple. You know, like like Trump's executive order to stop separating families. It's like, oh well it's the law, but yeah, you can executive order it away. If we if we there's two it's a two tier thing. Number one is teaching people about jury nullification and and victimless crime. Because if there's no victim, you know, you have to have like three legs for a crime. You know, they talk means motive and opportunity is one thing. Right. But you also have to have mens rea. You know, you have to have a guilty, you know, intent to commit a crime. You also have to have caused someone harm or damage. So there has to be a victim. If there's no victim, there's no crime. But we seem to have forgotten that because they don't teach law in, in, in high school, which I would like to see, you know, basic concepts of law taught in high school as well. That's getting back to education, right? So, executive order, ordering ordering sheriffs to make sure that the local police don't make any arrests for people growing industrial hemp, and make sure that the sheriffs understand that the federal government is not welcome in Georgia to enforce any of their stupid laws. The other thing is, it, it probably may happen in this nearest legislative cycle. You know, Mitch McConnell's pushing full legalization of industrial hemp. That's because it's uh, he's from Kentucky. He's from Kentucky, and and uh, governor, the governor there, Matt Bevin, has really been on a uh, a push for for to, to legalize hemp. And I think they have, have they not? Well, and and here you go. It's all about prosperity. 
Right. Suddenly the farmers are making money again. When the farmers make money, everybody's happy. The other thing about hemp, it does not require pesticides per se. It's also a, a, a insect repellent. So, you know, planting a row of, of cannabis in between your corn crop or your soybean crop would, would eliminate, you know, reduce your needs for pesticides, which means it's cheaper to grow. You know, your entire crop is, is, is less expensive. You're cutting your expenses down. You know, using less pesticides is better for the soil. There's no runoff. It doesn't go in the water supply. It doesn't poison us. You know, that's, that's the clean up the environment part. Right. So, so you now, mentioned. Now, I'm going to mention again. Just let's talk about hemp plastics. Hemp plastics biodegrade by themselves. So they don't last ten thousand years like a styrofoam cup does. Uh, they they last a couple of months out in the sun. So if if we were able to, you know, we can bring in all kinds of plastics industry, sandwich bags, you know, shopping bags, all that sort of thing, but other other plastics as well. Um, you know, even, even to the point of, of making plastic car bodies out of hemp plastic, which is a very 10 times the tensile strength of steel with a quarter of the weight. So if we're building lighter cars that are stronger, more crash proof, it's, it's, it's better for people in general. It's and better if, for the and planet, if, and requires less fuel to run. Yeah, and if there is a crash, then you just lay the car out in the sun for a couple of minutes <laughs> and, and it goes back to... It goes back. No, you, you put it you, in a grinder and you smoke it. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. You uh, you mentioned earlier something that I had uh, I had seen. The state it's called the SQLI. It's the State Quality of Life Index. And you know, Georgia is an interesting place in the sense that over a 20 year span, we went from hard blue, deep Democrat to bright red Republican in literally over 20 years. And you know that. That's an unusual occurrence in politics, and not not so much that a state changes, but how fast. I mean, in, in literally in 22 years, Georgia went from all all Democrat control to uh, a very short, you know, a balanced government between Democrats and Republicans to all what we have now, which is all Republican. And Republicans have controlled, uh, you know, the state for the last you know, the last decade. I, I can't remember. Was Zell Miller a Republican or a Democrat? He was a Democrat. And and if he was still alive now, he would be a Republican. Yes. Because this really kind of goes, in, in, in my analysis of the timeline, it goes back to the civil rights movement and, you know, the, the uh, you know, the whole equal rights thing. Right. You know, the Republicans, you know, the Democrats who... Well, let's, let's, let's go back. Let's go. Yesterday's Democrats, like the Zell Miller Democrats, right. are the same people as, you know, Governor Deal, you know, the, all of the entrenched elite Republicans were more than likely Democrats prior to the Civil Rights Movement. I was right. trying to remember the amendment that was the Voting Rights Act or whatever. Right. You know, ever since then, it seems like, again, in Georgia in particular, you know, the, the, the strongly Christian morality group with, um, I want to say, bigotry and hatred in their hearts of black people started abandoning the Democrat Party because that's where the blacks started to flow into the Democrat Party. And then started, like, the, the gay movement stuff, and it just drove more and more of the, of the staunch fundamentalist Christians out of the Democrat Party to the Republican Party. That's just my analysis. I may be way off. I don't know. Well, I mean, if you if you look carefully at the at the turnover from Democrat to Republican, you'll realize that there wasn't really a lot of turnover in the legislature per se. So so what you had is you had a lot of D to R switching, which goes back to what we talk about all the time, that really these are all the same people they've always been. Doesn't really matter what doesn't really matter what letters beside their name. And and <laughs> you know, they 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 are, you know, in essence, one body. I mean, exactly. look at look at the way they vote. I mean, there's very little opposition at the state. There's very little opposition. I know, and the you know, the, the, there's one person that votes no on the budget. And then of course they try to replace them, but 
Right, but 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 again, is that not that that is that is part of what we what, you know what I brought up in the beginning about the state of the state, which is the governor wields uh, a lot of power in the state, and you know libertarian Ted governor is going to bring some balance back. Well, some constitutional government back. I mean, everything that government can and cannot do is is written in those two documents: the, the Constitution of Georgia and the you know, the federal constitution. A lot of things that get done, a lot of things that come out of legislature are not constitutional. And therefore, anything that's not constitutional, I will, I will veto. And, 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 and rightly so, again, to bring balance back to, well, because right we now we just have to bring just, balance back as well. It's like, right. like forming, forming committees, review committees to actually take a look at some of the laws that are on the book for repeal you know, there's so many laws on the books that, that, that need to be repealed that are just like antiquated or, or specifically what I would term to be bills of attainder. You know, that's, that's what some of these transportation bills are, bills of attainder, giving a group of people taxpayer dollars to go perform a function that any contractor could do, but because it's a special group of people, that's what a bill of attainder is. Right. right. So, so another, you know, I'll go through, I've got a long list of different things. Again, these are things that are handled in the legislature, but the governor will have either some input or, you know, citizens are going to want to know how you feel about these issues because they'll sort of know what you plan to do with a bill that might land on your desk. So, health care. Healthcare in Georgia is a mess. It's a, we, we have rural hospitals closing left and right. Uh, Georgia still, for some reason, has certificate of needs where you uh, have... So you followed my 2014 insurance commissioner campaign. Um, basically, that was one of the points that I made. It's like the certificates of need program. Basically, what that is is a, is a board of directors in a county who may or may not happen to all have MD after their name, who, who may or may not also happen to own the only diagnostic clinic in the, in the area, who may or may not have a vested interest in keeping competition out, have to vote on whether or not they want a new facility in the area. That's, and, and that is monopolistic. It's oligarchic to have that much control over free enterprise. We don't have free enterprise. That's the whole thing. As a libertarian, we need free enterprise. We don't have free enterprise in the healthcare system. And, and my whole campaign was basically that we don't have a health care system. We have a sick care system because healthy people don't need a doctor. And then that will bring me back to hemp for just a moment because when, when we start feeding our, our livestock the hemp, they'll have the CBDs in the meat. It'll make us all healthier, which would reduce or eliminate our need for uh, the sick care system. One of the things that we know for a fact is that Almost 20% of our, of our GDP is spent on health care. And the fact of the matter is it's more of a shuffle of money. If you go, to, if you go anywhere else in the, in, in the world, you know, most, most insurance policies are based on paying a 20% copay, right? Right. In most other countries, the same 20% copay that you're paying here in America would cover the cost of whatever health care need you had. So they would, they would, in essence, be paying for it out of pocket. Well, you're basically right. paying for it out of pocket, and the other 80% is just shuffled around all the people who, um, I, I, I didn't bring it, but I wish I could show you right now the, the chart of, of the construction of Obamacare. Obamacare created 163 new agencies to oversee and get involved with, with health care delivery. I, all I need is a doctor. Give me a doctor and a nurse, and I'll go talk to them, and there's nobody else involved except the nurse and the doctor. That's only two people my, my fee has to cover. Now, the way the healthcare has, has become, you got the nurse and the doctor that you're in front of, but you have thousands of people behind them, all with their finger in the till. So now instead of paying $10 for a doctor visit, your doctor visit is being billed for $486 to cover all of the people who were involved in the healthcare administration and, you know, the, the tracking and the data collection and blah, blah, blah. 
That's what's wrong with healthcare is there's too many people involved that do not have a direct influence in your care with your doctor. So one of the things that I, I really like Florida has done and a couple other states have done what they call a concierge medical service, right? Where essentially it's just you and the doctor and nobody else is involved. Is oh, that heard the is Oklahoma that, clinic? Well, is that is that the marketplace? That, is that, that's that the marketplace is the market. solving that is a problem free, that government has not solve. Right. But the problem is, it's very difficult to to initiate one of those things again. For, for you can't really start a clinic without having a certificate of need. If you can't get the certificate of need, you really can't do the concierge medical facility. We should have a concierge medical facility in every low income housing area. That way, people can just walk down the street. They can see their doctor all the time. You know, there's there's a lot less cost when you put a doctor in a facility in a in a in a, in a three billion dollar building downtown. You know, you're just you're you're paying for maintenance. You're paying for rent. You're paying for like all this other stuff that doesn't directly impact your healthcare delivery. So again, part of breaking all this down is that we have too many people involved in healthcare that serve no healthcare delivery function other than making a paycheck out of like pushing a pencil. The other thing is telemedicine. We can have a clinic in every school. I, you know, we already have the school buildings. They used to have a school nurse, but now you have so many other administrators. We'll talk about that in a minute too. The problem with education is the same as the problem in healthcare is that they have so many administrators in the background making money for generating paperwork rather than actually being involved in the delivery of the service that the expense is borne by the taxpayer for no no real productive purpose so so, so just more telemedicine let's, let's yeah. telemedicine in, in a small facility we already have things like the minute clinics and such where you have like a, a, a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner we could have facilities like that small facilities uh, rural healthcare could be completely different and completely delivered through telemedicine and and nurse practitioners and physicians assistants. We don't really have any kind of a system because nobody's really thought it through of having like the doctor in a trailer and they are uh, you know the big bus right like a Winnebago they could have a traveling doctor goes around the neighborhood. My grandmother in the 1930s was a visiting nurse. In, in, in a rural community, one of the first ones. And it used to be the visiting nurse would go out and, and take care of all of the health care needs of essentially everyone in the community. We don't have that system anymore. We don't have it. We, we, we just have a retarded perspective of, of how health care should be delivered. And again, we don't teach it in school. And we have developed a, a whole culture of, of, of health seeking behavior that's perpetuated on the TV news the sponsors, if you have such and such, talk to your doctor about, you know, XYZ can help you. You know, we're being pushed into seeking treatment for things that don't need to be treated. You know, the whole thing about um, having Band-Aid, Band-Aid care is what I call it. If people understood that, okay, you have a cold, you know, take this and that, and, and if you're not well in five days, then go see a doctor. Instead, you know, first sniffle, you're at the doctor's office. You know, the kid scrapes his knee, you're at the doctor's office. And, you know, in a lot of cases, you're at the emergency room. Right. And that's another thing is like educating people, especially people who come here um, as adults, whose culture is that you go to the clinic when you have a problem. Instead, these people are going to the emergency room. We don't have like separate cultural clinics, clinical settings for people from cultures like that. So, you know, there's there's the whole education factor of actually starting teaching health and, and want to talk to a doctor and, you know, make a phone call, discuss it with a nurse before you even make a doctor's appointment. You know, we're not utilizing the resources that are available right now to reduce the cost of health care for people who just run to the doctor, run to the hospital, run to the emergency room at the at their first sign of a malady. All right, let's let's shift gears here. Big Big hot topic right now, obviously, is immigration. It is, it is front and center. So tell us, <laughs> tell us uh, how Governor Ted, uh, from the from the chief executive of the state, 
handles immigration. I want to, I will get to that, but first I want to say, did you notice that it's the same problem that's been going on for the last 20 years, and now suddenly it's an issue? Why is it an issue suddenly? If you look at the timing of the story, you know, the attorney or the um, inspector general just released his report on his investigation of the FBI's handling of the email scandal. That's not even in the news. They're talking about immigration, which is the same thing that's been going on for 20, 30 years. They shifted the focus away from what the real important issue was right now to something that's been a problem forever to divert our attention from the real issue, which is, you know, people need to be going to jail from the DNC and the FBI and other related areas. Right. Now, right. now I'll answer the question. Okay. Which was... <laughs> well, immigration's a, you know, immigration's a hot topic right now. And, yeah, of and, course you know, immigration is a hot topic you, because this you, is one of those issues, again, that is a diversion. Well, but, but if, you listen, if you listen to the Republicans, and all six of the Republicans were basically, they basically had the same stance, uh, which was, you know, let's get rid of all the people who don't look like us. Uh, let, let's ship them out. Let me say this. If you're white in America... You're an immigrant. You're the you're the you're the progeny of an I- immigrant. There's nothing in the Constitution that restricts immigration. There's only a clause that the government can control naturalization and citizenship. We have always had open borders until some crisis came up that somebody with some I don't know like like um, warped sense of morality or something decided to do something about it, like the Chinese or the Japanese internment during World War II. Right. So, again, so let, again let's focus specifically on Georgia, though. Let's, just, let's focus specifically on Georgia. Um, the fact that they're even talking about an issue that they really have no constitutional authority to even enter into, in my opinion, is a distraction from the actual issues that they can control. But let's talk about immigration real specifically. We're going to go back to 1945 when Social Security was first initiated. There were 255 workers paying into the system for every retiree. Jump ahead to 2018, there's 1.8 workers paying into the system for every person receiving benefits. Our current replacement rate of of birth death cycle is 1.8 that means 1.8 person is born for every person that dies we have the whole entitlement system you know the social security medicare all the tax based system stuff is based on a pyramid scheme right now if we're in zero population growth or in decline in our replacement rate <clears throat> One-to-one replacement rate would mean there's one person born for everyone that that dies. Two-to-one, that means that there's two people, there's actually one extra person to replace the person that dies. We need a replacement rate of like three to four to keep the Ponzi system going. Our system is heading for collapse. We desperately need immigration to maintain our, our taxpayer base so that they can maintain Social Security, Medicare, and all these other quote-unquote, entitlements in perpetuity. We can't do it without them. Immigrants in general, if you read all the studies, they are not involved in crime. They have a lower, lower crime statistic than any other group. They all, ha- if they want to get naturalized, they have to learn the Constitution. So they actually understand how government works. Most of them came here because, you know, America, the land of the free, Right? Give us your tired, you poor. Yearning to breathe free air. Yearning to be free. Again, federal government and state governments constitutionally have no authority to keep people out. And again, we need immigration to to replace the people who who are leaving. You, You realize now, Ted, we're talking about everyone here is, just just talk to them. They're all for legal immigration. It's the illegal immigration that they're concerned about. Illegal immigration. There's no such thing as illegal immigration. It's a construct. That's what I'm saying. There's nothing in the Constitution that pre- prevents anyone from entering our country. 
only prevention constitutionally is naturalization and citizenship. Being in the country is not against the law. So you you would be you would be for unchecked open borders. My real attitude about it is if 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 I were a hotel, I want my guests to check in at the front desk so I can keep track of how many there are, where they're going, but really nothing more than that. Yes, I would like to know who's coming in the country. You know, because there are terrorists that come in the country. But, you know, otherwise, you know, if if they if that's what you want to call legal immigration, in my opinion, it's all migration. We've been migrating for our entire hundred thousand year human history. Right, right. All right. So, so, so did I answer you know yes, that, that's the answer to my question. Yes, I, that, I, I, that, I don't mind them coming here, but I want to know who they are. Yeah, I mean I, I and that's about it. Yeah. You know? I mean and come that, in, and sign I, in sign the guest book. Come on in. Sign the guest book. Come on in. What changes and and now you're going to be talking specifically to the voters. What changes would Georgians see having a libertarian governor? And I know that's an all-encompassing question. So you know, brevity in in the sense that tell us how government would function under libertarians as opposed to how it functions now. Constitutionally, and then that's really the key, because you know, right now under our crony system, government is run. A muck, <laughs> you know. It, it it is it's totally tyrannical. It's it's a bunch of like, I'll I'll just say it. It's it's a bunch of ruling elite who get their way and get their way for their buddies, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's not for we the people. Government has forgotten that the people are sovereign to the government, and that's what I think. You know, my bully pulpit will will bring back is is the notion in people's mind that they're supposed to represent us and they're supposed to do what we want not not the other way around so as a libertarian government i will end the mission creep the mission bloat you know georgia really doesn't even have as 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 a government georgia doesn't really even have a mission statement there's no one who's tracking the the whole cycle of okay we're going to implement this new policy and then we're going to throw money at it and then the agency's going to grow and then add more people nobody's tracking whether or not it's even been effective and in a lot of cases they don't even look to see if these programs are necessary to begin with so as a libertarian governor i will make sure that everything that they do is necessary and constitutional and if it's not then we're going to take it we're going to we're going to repeal it we're going to break it down as as the libertarian governor, I want to shrink govern, government. Shrinking government shrinks taxes. I want to bring in a new revenue source, cannabis, everything cannabis, which would be a huge tax boon, which would lessen the amount of taxes on each individual citizen. So under a libertarian government, under a libertarian governor, they will see a lot more prosperity, a lot more freedom, and a lot more take-home pay. Excellent. Better education, better health care, better transportation, more rights, less oppression on, on, on minorities and, and, you know, lesbian, gay community is going to be treated just like everyone else. I want equality. I want, I want tranquility and I want prosperity. Again, by the simple fact that I can mandate no more arrests for marijuana position, possession, and also say that I will personally guarantee that anyone with a marijuana conviction on their record, I will, I will give them a pardon. That will allow them to get a job. That will lessen our tax burden to, to taxpayer giveaway to the private, private prison industry and as well as the private probation industry. It will unclog our courthouses, unclog our court systems, and allow the police to concentrate on actual crime against property and against person. So Ted, so Ted, congratulations on, uh, on your, uh, running for governor. I know it's a big, uh, I know it's a big deal. Tell people how they can not only donate to Ted, but also if they want to help libertarians in general, and also the 
Libertarian Party of Georgia. Tell them, tell them how they can do that. I have a website up and kind of running partially. <laughs> I'm really not planning to launch that until after the 4th of July. Right. Um, if you want to find out more about me, I'm on Facebook, Ted Metz for Governor. I'm also tedmetz.com, Ted Metz on Twitter, Ted Metz at we, me, we, Ted Metz on Reddit, and Steam it. You know, you can find me anywhere. I'm easy to find. Um, if you want to contribute to my campaign, that would help us out a lot for necessary supplies, radio ads, TV ads, newspaper ads, and also donate to the party. Go to lpgeorgia.com and donate to us. You know, five, ten bucks even. If we get, you know, if we had a thousand people giving us five bucks, that'd be five grand, right? That's easy math. You know? Excellent. And, and that's what we need. We need funding. All of our candidates need funding. All of our candidates are listed on our website at lpgeorgia.com. And, and, and just as a reminder to everybody, um, libertarians do not take money. We don't take money from corporations, from lobbyists. You're saying we're anti-bribery? We are, we are totally anti-bribery, totally anti-bribery. But that's an important distinction because while the, while the, the, the two-party system is out there uh, collecting millions. Swapping interstate PAC money. Millions of dollars, libertarians are asking for five dollars to get lunch. For, yeah, from the from the <laughs> grassroots. So, Ted, I want to I want to thank you for uh, for your time, and I look forward to casting my vote in November for for your uh, for your governor governorship. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, our producer extraordinaire, as always, behind the scenes, Matt Franklin of Most Uniquest, and. Before you, you sign to... off, I'll say one more thing. Sure, go ahead, Ted. I know that you can see me on video, and I'm gonna. I'm here to tell you that if you believe what they say that cell phone radiation doesn't cause skin cancer, they're lying to you. Keep your cell phone away from your head. Good, good, good safety tip there. Uh, if you want to find out anything about libertarian candidates who are running for office, uh, go to lpgeorgia.com slash about slash candidates. There'll be a, uh, that link will be in the show notes along with all of Ted's uh, uh, information. Again, Ted, thanks. And thanks for having me, Brent. And until next and time. And you too, Matt. Until next time. Liberty. You've been listening to the official podcast of the Libertarian Party of Georgia. The theme song for this episode was Metaltania by Kevin McLeod, released to the public domain through freepd.com. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to rate us and leave a review. You can email the show's producers at podcast at lpgeorgia.com. If you're a libertarian in the state of Georgia, don't forget to find your local affiliate at lpgeorgia.com.